the things I want us to think about this morning uh, in the fact that, that we celebrate the Christmas story and the birth of the Christ child in what the angels pronounced and announced, the angels made it clear that, that Christ was born, a Savior was born. We might want to mute Keith's mic there, guys. Thank you. So um, the, the angels made it clear that when Christ was born, born a Savior, that Christ came to bring salvation. So let me ask this about that salvation. Where does salvation come from? How is it that you and I are saved? How is it that we enter heaven in this salvation that we celebrate? Well, in the book of Romans, Paul wrote. Paul wrote to a group of Christians, and in chapter 10, he writes about how he longed for salvation for his fellow countrymen. And he says this in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Salvation was important to him, and he longed for his fellow countrymen to get saved. And he says in verse 3, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Now, what's true of Paul's countrymen, that, that they didn't know and understand God's righteousness, and they strived to create their own, think of righteousness for now as goodness. And, and in order to enter heaven, you could go all through the New Testament and see that God's plan throughout the Old and the New Testament is in order to be brought near to God and find salvation, you would need righteousness or goodness. So just how good, just how righteous do you and I have to be in order to find that salvation and to enter heaven? Well, I want to try to illustrate this with some help from the kids. So... Those of you that are in elementary, some of you know this. Uh, some of the kids are aware that during Christmas time, I set up a tree in my office. I call it the man tree because I want to I get in on the Christmas decorating, but not with like all the frills. Uh, on the man tree, there are lights that are John Deere tractors, fishing bobbers, uh, duck call, f fishing uh, lures. There used to be, but with kids around, I took all the hooks and hid those. Uh, there's pheasant feathers in there. There's no star on the tree topper. It's a deer antler that's on top. And there's no tree skirt. It's a, a mink fur or something like that. I'm not sure. Some, some critter that Joel probably trapped and killed, and now it's laying at the bottom of the tree. You know, that kind of thing. So it's the man tree. And on the man tree, during the month of December, the kids run back to my office, and they used to be able to get candy canes and chocolate ornaments. And the store I usually get the chocolate ornaments from, like, they quit carrying them. I was bummed. Uh, so kids, sorry, there's just been candy canes this year, and I wanted to see if I could make up for it a little bit with some of the kids that came to church this morning. So if, if you're in kindergarten through sixth grade and you want to help me out, uh, I need to see if there's some kids that are tall enough to be... Now, now keep in mind, you may not everybody get this, but if you want to make your way down front... Now, moms or those that need to keep track of nut allergies, okay, Reese's, Kit Kats, plain Hershey bars and uh, Hershey's with whole almonds. So those are the selections. But if you want to try to see how kindergarten through sixth grade, come on up here, kindergarten through sixth grade, I need to see. We're going to do this in a couple groups, okay? So if you are, if you are, if you're, th we're going to do a couple groups, all right? So don't worry. If you're coming down from the front, you'll get here, all right? If you're like third through sixth grade, stay back in the back, all right? Kindergarten through second grade, come up here. Kindergarten through second grade, we're going to start with you guys, okay? Kindergarten through second grade, get close. The older ones are in the back, all right? They're still making their way. Okay, you guys, all right? Ready? Okay? Come right in here, because I don't want anybody to trip on the stairs, okay? Are you tall enough to get these candy bars? That's the question, all right? Jump. Get them, okay? Come on, higher. Jump higher. So close. Okay, come here, guys. Come here. You stand right here, okay? Stand right here. You older kids get in here, okay? I want to see if you are tall enough to get the candy bars. Jump, okay? Oh, jump, jump. Come on, higher. Higher. Wait, wait for it. Okay, wait for it. These guys didn't get to try. These guys, wouldn't you know it, which kid was that, all right? Come over here. Come over here. Come on in here, guys. Come on. Okay, you older ones, back up. Stay here. Don't go away. Don't go away. Come here. Come here. You guys didn't get to try. Are you tall enough? Are you tall enough? Jump high. Come on. 
so close. Okay, come here, guys. Come here. Everybody come in, okay? Now. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Come right here. Come right here, okay? Now. I got to shut, shut my microphone off because I can't give away all the At the end of the message, I'll make it really clear. I'll make it really clear. Oh, no. Uh, my, biggest, my biggest fear in all of this was tears at the end of it, and unfortunately we did have somebody. Okay, so maybe these guys weren't just tall enough. So Jimbo and Josh, Jimbo and Josh, all right? Maybe the, maybe the situation was that they just weren't tall enough. So Jimbo and Josh, come right here. I need you to stand right here, okay? Come in real close, okay? All right, just a second. Okay. Okay, now, do not hurt yourselves jumping, because I don't want a phone call from your basketball coach wondering what happened at church on Christmas morning. Can you reach it? Go for it. Here we go. Don't get on the platform. Uh, oh! Wow! Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, go back. Thank you. Way to totally ruin a sermon illustration, all right? I thought I'd be able to keep them out. So, pretend they couldn't do that, all right? Pretend they couldn't reach, all right? Why couldn't they reach if they couldn't, okay? Well, you might say because I wasn't tall enough standing on the chair. And you might, you might just say, well, what? You might just say, like, uh, what kind of a jerk idea was that, you know? Like, call the kids up, get them excited about candy, let them get trampled and run over. Um, like, am I just Scrooge? Is this my bah humbug moment, right? Well, let's think about this for a second. I want us to compare just a little bit of... Being tall enough to reach candy, I know all illustrations break down, right? But transfer this to a spiritual sense of attaining salvation. If you have to be good enough to get salvation, if you have to be righteous, well, how good do you have to be to get salvation? And, and God doesn't just give salvation to everyone. So why? Is God just, is he kind of mean and grumpy that comes up with these ideas of, hey, you must be this high to enter and you can't make it. Is that, is that the situation? Well, no. If we must be righteous like God is righteous to enter heaven, God is not just mean that he doesn't look at those who don't achieve righteousness and not allow them into heaven. It's not as if God is just a grump. Uh, the way we think about, the way that we treat, the way that we, the value we place on objects is directly parallel to the inherent worth of that object. Depending on how valuable we think it is, it affects and changes the way we interact. So, take this vase for instance, right? If I was to give this vase to you and say, hey, uh, five minutes before the service, I went into the church's storage compartments and found like dozens of vases and picked one out. I'm giving it to you so you can do something with. That may or may not be true as to where I found it. <clears throat> if that's the value you thought this had, that it hasn't been used for years and years and years, st sitting in a storage cupboard, it would sit and roll around in the back of your car for a few weeks until either you threw it in the trash or donated it to Goodwill, right? But if I came to you and said, my wife's great-great-dead grandmother gave this to her great-grandmother on her wedding day, and it has been passed down to every Wiedemeyer daughter on their wedding day. I don't know why they would want a vase on their wedding day, but they might, you know, uh, and, and someday Ivy's going to get this. Would you, would you hold on to this for me? Well, you would, you would treat it gently and carefully, and you would make sure nothing happened to it. It would go home and get put in a china cupboard, right? Imagine if you were to come to my house and, and see my garage. First of all, you're going to have to pretend there's enough room in my garage for a car. 
instead of my kid's junk, right? But pretend you could get into my garage and you saw my car there, right? And you come in and you've got some little rambunctious ones with you. And uh, when some, you know, some people are careful about not getting scratches on their cars. Imagine that the car that's sitting in my garage is like a 2002 Honda Accord with 250,000 miles. The doors are rusted out. It doesn't have a muffler. When it starts, you know, it sounds like this horrible machine that's about to die. And imagine if, you know, I looked at you and I said, careful, don't scratch the car. Well, you'd look at me and say, that guy's weird, right? What's his problem? Why does he care about that hunk of junk so much? But if you walked into my garage and saw a Lamborghini with like this glossy mirror-like finish, well, I wouldn't have to tell you not to scratch the car. You'd, you'd be like covering your kids' mouths so they didn't breathe on the car, right? Like, I mean, we just instantly get it. So in that way, we, the way we treat something is directly proportional to its inherent value. So if you and I had the ability to comprehend the glory of God, which we don't, but if we could... Well, then Romans 3.23 would make total sense. Romans 3.23 says this, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you and I could understand just how good God is, well, yeah, it makes sense that we're not good enough to enter heaven, that we don't have the righteousness we need. So where are we going to get that righteousness? Where does salvation come from? Hold that thought. Because here's where the Christmas story comes into play. Let's go to Luke chapter 2 in the verses that I just read and think about what's taking place. So Luke is telling us that in, in set in the stage of human history, Caesar Augustus sends out this decree and he moves people around for a registration, for some kind of taxation. None of the other gospel writers let us know what's going on here. But it's important for Luke to set the birth of Christ in its historical context. Something like uh, some type of enrollment before a taxation would take place. And God does this to get Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. Why was Bethlehem important? Well, if you remember in the Old Testament, Bethlehem was the hometown of David. It's where David grew up. It was on David's throne that the Messiah... It was, it was the Messiah coming to enact a better kingdom to restore everything that God's people had lost when David was king and when the subsequent kings had their failures. And so David was a special king and there were prophecies for God's people. You could go to the book of Micah where it's prophesied that the Messiah would come from the town of Bethlehem. So if Joseph is from the town of Nazareth, well, that's where Joseph and Mary are living. And here's Mary pregnant with the Christ child. And in order for Micah to be fulfilled, God is going to orchestrate through this human governor to get Joseph and Mary back to Bethlehem. Now, why did Mary have to go? We're not totally certain why. It's more than likely that just Joseph needed to be there for the registration. It was his hometown. It's possible Mary also legally needed to be there, but think about the situation and circumstances that here's Mary far along in her pregnancy. Remember what her reputation is like at this point because she isn't yet married and here she is about to give birth and it's possible that Mary said, there's no way I'm hanging out here, not with what people are saying, I'm going with you, Joseph. And so God gets Joseph and Mary all the way to Bethlehem so that the Christ child can be born. And here's what happens. I'm going to read... And starting in verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. What a precious promise for you and I that the Christ child was born. Mary's first son, God became a baby. God became a human. God took on flesh. Think about what this means, that the Christ child was born. He took on flesh. He was laid in a manger. Why did Jesus come? Why was Jesus born? What is it that we celebrate on this Christmas day 
of remembering Christ's birth and Christ's coming. Remember that Christ's birth leads straight to Christ's death. That Bethlehem leads to Golgotha. That the manger leads to the cross. In order for God to fulfill his plan of salvation, God himself had to take on human flesh and be born. John Piper talks about this, and this is what he says. In order for Jesus to suffer and die, he had to plan for it way ahead of time. Because as the word, Logos, who existed before creation, he couldn't die. He was immortal. He didn't have any body, therefore he could not die. And yet he wanted to die for you. So he planned the whole thing by clothing himself with a body so that he could get hungry and get weary and get sore feet. The incarnation is the preparation of nerve endings for the nails. That's what the incarnation is. The incarnation is the preparation of a brow for thorns to press through. He needed to have a broad back so that there was a place for the whip. He needed to have feet so that there was a place for spikes. He needed to have a side so that there was a place for the sword to go in. He needed cheeks, fleshy cheeks, so that Judas would have a place to kiss and there would be a place for the spit to run down that the soldiers spit on him. He needed a brain and a spinal column with no vinegar and no gall so that the exquisiteness of the pain could be fully felt. This is what it means that God became flesh and became a Christ child so that salvation could be enacted, so that the plan could be put in place because the manger would lead to the cross. Now, notice what happens when the Christ child was born. If God, through Jesus Christ, if Jesus is the king of the universe, how does he make his entrance into the world? Verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. The king of the universe has this humble, unassuming birth laid in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, there's a lot of traditions that make their way into the understanding of this verse, and frankly, some of it, we just don't have a very good understanding of exactly where was Christ born. We don't know for sure, but one thing that's, more, that's probably likely No place for them in the inn. Our minds go to like a no vacancy sign on a hotel. That could have happened, but it's debatable whether or not Bethlehem would have even had an inn type place for visitors passing through. The the word that's translated inn could just be dwelling place. It could also be translated guest room. What could be happening here is that particularly in houses that weren't of wealthy estate, it was common for the average house to have a guest room or some other type of place and the family would sleep upstairs and animals would be brought in at night where the house was still warm and there would be a manger there. There would be a feeding trough in the main house and just everybody is together under one roof. Well, if the whole countryside is rearranging housing in places, the house is full and there's not a suitable place. So that could be what's taking place. It could have been a cave like some of the other traditions say. We don't exactly know what's happening, but what we do know and understand from this fact that there was no suitable place for the Christ child to be laid, and he ends up being laid in a feeding trough, we just sang away in a manger the fact that there was no place for the Christ child to, no crib to lay in, that what's happening here is the, the fact that God intentionally set forth that Christ's birth would be lowly, that it would be humble, that it would not be with pomp and circumstance. It wouldn't be grandiose. Think about this. If God, had, if God could get Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem, God could have had a room in a palace. He could have. God intentionally planned it this way, that there was no room in the end. God intentionally planned for the Christ child to be laid into a manger. 
God could have done anything he wanted, and he showed his sovereignty over the orchestrating of events, but he wanted the Christ child to be laid in this manger trough. Why? Because it sets the pattern for why Christ came in his humble and low estate. In the book of Philippians, think about what this means that Christ was coming. In Philippians chapter 2, Here's what Paul says. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That was Christ's lowly and humble example that Christ was willing to empty himself note this he didn't give up the things that made him God he didn't empty himself by stopping to be God the passage says that he emptied himself by taking on human flesh Augustine said Christ who excuse me Christ emptied himself not by losing what he was but by taking to him what he was not Christ became flesh so that he would be able to die for us. Think about the contrast here and the irony that the creator of the universe, the, the one who has the ability to orchestrate events to get Mary and Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem, chooses to allow himself to enter our world in a lowly manger stall. What's happening there? A man named R.G. Lee said it this way, Listen, this is a lengthy quote, but it's encouraging for us to think about. Christ, who in eternity rested motherless upon the Father's bosom, and in time rested fatherless upon a woman's bosom, clasping the ancient of days who had become the infant of days. What deep descent. Think about what happened. From the height of glory to the depths of shame, from the wonders of heaven to the wickedness of earth, from the exaltation to humiliation, from the throne to the tree, from dignity to debasement, from worship to wrath, from the halls of heaven to the nails of earth, from the coronation to the curse, from the glory place to the gory place. In Bethlehem, humility and glory in their extremes were joined. He was born in a stable, cradled in a cattle trough, wrapped in swaddling cloths of poverty. No room for him who made all rooms. No place for him who made and knows all places. Oh, deep humiliation of the creator, born of the creature, woman. But in his descent was the dawn of mercy. And catch this Last sentence right here. Because we cannot assent to him, he descends to us. That's what's happening in the incarnation. This is what God is doing when the Christ child was born. And this is where salvation comes from. Scripture makes it clear that we all fall short of the glory of God. We can never attain God's glory. No matter how hard we work, our own efforts cannot ascend to God's glory. We cannot make it in our own efforts, in our own righteousness. Coming to church, our good deeds, living the right way, cannot cause us to ascend to God's glory. God had to have another plan. He had to have another way. And God said, what I require, I myself will fulfill by coming to live for you, to die for you, and to rise again. That's what God did through the person of Christ. He sends the Christ child, and Christ came down to us. God came down because we could never go up. That's what God did, and that's where salvation come from. So kids, those of you who weren't able to get the candy, forget Jimbo and Josh, all right? Yeah. It's not that you didn't get the candy because you weren't tall enough. It's that the candy needed to come down lower. So here's what you kids get this morning on Christmas, as if you haven't had enough candy all ready all week, right, to the parents' dismay. So when the service is over, kids, you're going to get to come pick out candy, all right? 
keep in mind, brothers and sisters, okay, this is what God did for us, right? He knew we could not attain salvation on our own, so he came down to our level. That's what the Christ child did. We could never ascend to him. He came down to us. That's the Christmas story. Marvel in it. Take joy and comfort. Be encouraged in God the King coming down to earth. And and then I would ask, have you made that personal? If Christ's example was humility then you and I, there is no salvation apart from Christ. We too must humble ourselves and call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, where we come to the end of ourselves and in our humility and repentance realize, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's no salvation found apart from Christ. And so if you're here this morning and you haven't realized that Christ came down to you and that you need to humbly acknowledge and repent of your sins and trust in what Christ has done on the cross for your salvation. That's what we invite you to this morning. Scripture says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you do that if you haven't yet? Would you repent of your sins and trust in Christ for salvation? That's the only way of salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful that you came down to us. We're thankful for the gift of salvation through the person of Christ encourage us with it. Lord, would the Christians here be encouraged and reminded of your great love that that you desired to come to us for salvation. Father, would you in conviction for those who haven't yet turned of their sins and trusted in Christ. Would today be a day of salvation that we would realize our own helplessness and need to turn to Christ. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen.